Good evening. Good evening. My name is Tom Michaud, and I am a board member of the Foreign Policy Association. And on behalf of the Foreign Policy Association, I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's event. As you know, the Foreign Policy Association is dedicated to educating the world about international relations and key events that are happening that dramatically impact the relationships between countries. And we're delighted to have two of the world's experts, really, speak to us about a couple of very important issues that are impacting the world and global growth uh, at the moment. So to, before I introduce uh, our speakers this evening, I'd also like to comment that this is an exciting week for the Foreign Policy Association. As you know, we, we sponsor the Great Decisions series. Uh, it's one of the longest running series on television as well as in the country in terms of educational mod modules. And we have uh, high school teachers from the US and Canada uh, in New York City this week uh, as part of our Teacher Training Institute. And it's been an exciting program, and welcome to all of you who are in town for that. I'd also like to say that we're going to be videoing this presentation and showing it globally on YouTube as part of our series as well. So welcome to all of those around the world who are going to be with us for tonight's presentation. We have two experts uh, with us uh, this evening. Uh, our second speaker is Steve Brozak, who I will be introducing uh, shortly. Uh, after our first speaker speaks this evening, our first speaker is Joyce Chang, who is the Chair of Global Research at J.P. Morgan. Uh, Joyce has had a tremendous career at J.P. Morgan. She's one of the, the country's leading analysts, particularly in the area of fixed income, where I thought it was most particular that she has been inducted into the Fixed Income Analyst Society Hall of Fame. Uh, she, the department that she leads has been ranked by Institutional Investor as the number one research department in the world. Uh, Joyce is also very interested in what happens around the world. She's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, she also is on the board of directors of the German Marshall Fund. And she's also been named one of the top 25 most powerful women in finance by the American banker. And she's also on the Barron's 100 Most Influential Women in Finance. Uh, unfortunately, she got called out of New York City uh, this evening, so we're gonna utilize uh, technology, and she's gonna be joining us uh, via Zoom to make her presentation, uh, and I look forward to her 20 minute or so presentation. We're gonna have Steve present for about 20 minutes, and then we're gonna have a joint Q&A session. So with that, I'd like to turn the evening over to Joyce, who's gonna walk through her presentation, talking to us about the global economy and what the chances are for a soft landing or hard landing, and what, a, what is her view of where the economy is headed. Joyce? Thank you so much, Tom, for that generous introduction, and it's wonderful to be with all of you. Um, just such great admiration and respect for the work of the Foreign Policy Association and the outreach that we have. So just delighted to be with Tom and also with Stephen. So I have a PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to walk through to go through our key views on the global economy. Well, there is an old saying that's attributed to Lenin that says, you know, there are decades when nothing happens and then there are weeks when um, decades happen. And I'm gonna just turn to the first slide to set the tone. So if you could advance the first slide, so where are we in the markets today? Well, if you look back over the last century, we're actually at the third worst start to the S&P 500 in the last century. It is the worst total returns that we have actually seen in fixed income markets in more than 40 years. It's the um, highest inflation we've also seen in 40 years. And if you look at what's happened with global growth, it is actually the um, fastest deceleration after a recession that we've seen in global growth in about 80 years. So we're setting a lot of um, history here when we look at just how quickly the markets have had to react to circumstances. So I'm going to just talk through the forecast revisions that we've done since the beginning of the year, since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And if we could advance to the next slide. So this is our forecast across um, the global economy, looking at the developed markets and the emerging markets. And really, if you look at the graphs below, you can see the upward revision to global inflation. And you can see the downward revisions that we've taken to GDP growth. 
And we do have um, inflation. Um, you know, so if you look at just what we have done for the first half of the year in our global forecast, we've actually taken a 2.6 percent points off of global growth since Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February. Um, and we have taken the inflation forecast up by um, more than three full percentage points. And when we look at where inflation is running, um, you know, we are at 40 year highs right now. So it has been um, a uh, first half of the year that has been marked by um, you know, very um, severe tightening of financial conditions, slower growth, higher inflation. And I would just start by saying that I do think this is a period of regime change. We are leaving this period of great moderation that had dominated for the last 40 years. But taking a closer look at our forecasts here on this table, you can see that for the U.S. economy, we have growth at only half a percentage point um, for the first half of the year. We have a recovery to 2% in the second half. But I would say there are downside risk um, you know, to that forecast. And the other big um, you know, downward revision we did was on China. China, because of the COVID lockdowns, growth was only 0.7% in the first half of the year. Now, we do see um, a better second half of the year that lies ahead. And our scenario is not a recession, but we do think that if you take a look at our um, economic models, the risk of recession has gone up to about 35%. So these are material revisions that we've taken to the growth forecast. We do see U.S. recession risks that are rising into 2023 20, um, if inflation remains elevated. And taking a look at how the Fed is responding to higher inflations, um, we are forecasting in total 300 basis points of Fed hikes um, in this calendar year. So it is um, still that there is you know, you know, much further that the Fed will need to go even after you know, the moves that they have done um, very recently. So let me um, just turn to the next slide and talk more about the um, inflation dynamics. Well, the, the first thing I would say is that the inflation that we are seeing is very broad based. It's not just the supply chain. And when we take a look at um, you know, the inflationary pressures, you know, energy prices, um, food prices are a big part of this, but also rent inflation, that's, um, you know, is a, um, a, a, a big piece of this. And we also have the wage inflation. And so what you can see is that um, as we've seen the inflation go up, you've also seen this plummet in consumer confidence. And even though we have seen consumer spending hold in very well during um, the um, last couple of months, because there are excess savings that are going into uh, the, you know, the um, as, as, as we go into this period of downturn. What we are seeing is that the confidence um, really um, has plummeted here. But the inflation is broad based and it's also global. It's not just the United States. Now, Asia is more of an exception. But if you look at the emerging markets country, um, food inflation in many of the emerging markets baskets is as much as 40% of the inflation basket. So you're hearing more about protests that are coming out of um, you know, the um, you know, Middle Eastern countries, also the Southeast Asian countries, where this is just um, a big concern with respect to social stability. So this, um, you know, th th this, is, this is really the key conundrum that the Fed needs to deal with. Um, I wanted to just go to the next slide and talk um, more specifically about Russia, Ukraine, and the shock that this provided. So the Russian commodity shock has actually hit um, Europe the hardest. But Russia has also been able to find new buyers for its oil. Um, so they have actually had a cushion because oil prices are so high. You see one of the largest current account surpluses that they are running because, um, you know, because of the high oil prices and because um, it has been very hard for them to actually import because of the sanctions that are in place. But Europe has been hit the hardest. And I'm in Washington, D.C. doing this presentation. The talk was not so much about a U.S. recession, but about a European recession. And I would just say that um, even though Russia's linkages into the financial markets are relatively limited, they've had sanctions in place since 2008, they play a very large role um, in emerging markets economies. They're still the second largest oil exporter. They still are the largest provider of military equipment to Africa, to India. And so um, it is very significant. And, and, and Europe is suffering the most. 
as you have that, um, you know, they are the ones that um, have been the most dependent, you know, on Russia for their um, oil and their gas supplies, um, you know, and um, you can also just see that the inflation in Europe is running ahead of the United States right now. Um, just turning to the next slide. Um, I wanted to just say a word um, about China because much of the recovery in the global economy that lies ahead will um, actually depend on China. Now, we have a forecast at JP Morgan that China will actually reach the same size as the US economy by the end of the decade. And the contribution to global growth from China has actually been larger, um, the largest contribution, larger than the United States since the global financial crisis. So we had... Uh, um, China with the COVID policies go to um, you know um, a very big contraction in growth in the second quarter of this year, more than five a five point four percent contraction in growth. We've taken down China's growth um, forecast to only three point three percent this year, and this is only the second time in the modern history of China where they are actually underperforming their official growth target, which is five and a half percent, the other year being the year of the pandemic in 2020. But we do see that economic activity is recovering. We do have um, China's activity um, rebounding after contracting in the second quarter to you know, quarter on quarter, seven and a half percent in the third quarter, bringing the full year growth to three and a half 3.3%. Uh, and that's um, a very important, as far as the China demand story, what this means for the supply chains. Um, but let's now turn and talk more about the U.S. forecast on the next slide. We do see that the tighter financial conditions are going to weigh on demand growth. And in our forecast, um, we do have um, gas at the pump going to six dollars you know before the end of the summer um, and that is because of the refining capacity has been very limited but we have us um, gdp growth actually going to below potential by the first half of 2023 in large part because of tighter financial conditions that are weighing on demand growth and what we are seeing is um, you know a stronger dollar um, we've seen, um, if you take a look at the 30-year um, mortgage rates, we've seen that actually double over the last, um, you know, um, you know, few months. Um, you know, um, as far as the speed of the acceleration of the increase, and you can see that even though we have seen um, the third worst sell-off in the equity markets over the last century, you can see that for the level of the S&P 500, we are still at pretty elevated levels compared to history. But we have growth in the first half of 2023 in the US um, slowing to one and a half percent. Some of this reflects um, demographics in the United States and only to 1% by the second half of the year. So I would not say that it is a recession. One thing that's very different about the cycle is that we're going into this with very strong household balance sheets and corporate balance sheets, but um, it is um, really going to below potential growth um, in the United States with uh, increased risk of recession. So looking at the next um, slide, as we look at the risk ahead, I would say that when, you know, last year, the buzzword was transitory. Um, and, it, it, uh, you know, uh, I think there really is a risk of lasting changes to the supply, um, global supply, which are not transitory. And um, this chart really just illustrates some of the dilemma that we're facing right now when we look at the labor market conditions and also um, the challenge that is facing the Fed as far as the policy reaction. So the demographics are very important to our overall outlook on the U.S. growth outlook. And part of that is just the slowdown that we see in population growth, which is not just um, something that's occurring in the U.S. It's also in the euro area, in the U.K., China and Russia both also have very challenging demographics that points to a period of slower growth and higher inflation that we're entering into. And some of these issues are structural. And the one slide that I you know, have always included is just um, the um, effect that we have of immigration policy to U.S. population growth and some of the labor shortfall that we're seeing. And um, what you are seeing is that, you know, our, our estimate on sort of the shortfall that you have in labor it, you know, is as much as 3.2 million. Um, and that's going to have an impact on growth. So we're at record low um, unemployment rates, but you still see that many of these issues are structural with respect to 
labor force participation rates, the decline in population growth. And um, that and that is, I think, the challenge that the Fed is having to address right now. Really, the, this labor tightness is real, and together with the Fed's reactive policy setting, it raises the risk that this cycle will not end in a soft landing. So a soft landing is a very hard task here, and you can see that very clearly on the next slide. Um, the labor tightness is real. You know, I'm in Washington, D.C. Um, you know, um, the flights were canceled this morning. The last train that even leaves here is at eight is is you know is at eight p.m. from Washington, D.C. In part because of the labor shortages, not, everything is not operating. And so this is why when people say, "Is it transitory with the supply chain? If China is reopening, will we address some of these bottlenecks?" Um, the, the, the issue is that this is all sort of interconnected. So, you know, when you talk to people in the commodities market, they say, look, the problem is not just, you know, the um, you know, supply of oil. It is that you can't find labor in West Texas where you need to pay a truck driver $150,000 a year because of how tight the labor market is. And that really is, I think, the key risk to asking the question, is this going to end in a recession and what kind of recession is this? So the risk of a recession is going up. If you look at our models, which are on the left-hand side at the bottom, we have the risk of recession at about 50-50. So we're not calling for a recession, but it's a very hard task to navigate. Um, this is the first tightening cycle that is happening into a, a downturn, and when inflation is so far above where the inflation target is at. And, and that is the key challenge to engineering um, a soft landing in our view. Um, and as I said, some of these problems are structural. Now, looking at the next slide, this really uh, gives you a closer snapshot of the um, you know, how we are looking at why this crisis is different than um, past crises. So if you take a look at the global financial crisis, um, it took about eight years to close the output gap um, for the developed markets, in this case, the output gap will close in three years. And we do think you're entering a period of shorter and more volatile cycles. So um, if the average expansion and recession previously was 10 to 11 years, in this period, we think you're going to a period where it's more like five to six years and we're through year three, is your recession risk higher? And our models are showing 50-50 um, chance of a recession. And I think one important consideration to look at is just the tightening in financial um, conditions that we've seen occur very rapidly on the next slide. And on the next slide, what you can see is that we estimate that household wealth has fallen by you know, five to eight trillion dollars year to date, just since the beginning of the year, since um, financial conditions have tightened. And you can see that with this period of zero interest rates, how much of household wealth really got accumulated into financial assets, into real estate holdings, um, real estate wealth, equity, and debt holdings. So the financial conditions um, are very important. Um, and that is a, you know, a, you know, a problem in many ways, because if you look at the next slide, market liquidity um, is really um, problematic right now. Um, now, we're not at market liquidity conditions that are March 2020, but we estimate that market liquidity is about 30% below where it was pre-pandemic. Across all asset classes, FX markets, even looking at the oil market, looking at tips, looking at treasuries, looking at the S&P 500. So we're in a period of what we think will be shorter and more volatile cycles with higher inflation and slower growth ahead. Now, what are the silver linings in this? Um, on the next slide, what you can see is that we came into this crisis in a very different place than past crises with very high savings rates. The U.S. had a 14% excess household savings rate. Now, we've actually um, dropped that down significantly. You can see that that's actually dropped in the U.S. And as always is the case, Japan is an outlier. The whole uh, global outlook has concerned them more. They've actually increased the savings in Japan. Um, and the question is, like, those savings are cushioned now, but we have eaten through them. What will this mean um, as we eat through those excess savings, which we think will be back to where the long-term average has been by the end of the year. But I would just say that um, the household debt um, as a whole still is at a 20-year low. And that's because you know this period of very low interest rates, um, many corporations were able to stretch out the debt. We didn't have the time to accumulate some of these debt excesses um, at the same level that they had been in previous crises.
So that gives us more cushion this time. But all in all, um, a soft landing, in our opinion, remains a very hard task. A recession is not inevitable because the private sector and the households are in better shape. But the key thing that we are watching in all of this is the um, ability of the Fed to manage the higher inflation, which is coming from very broad base, but also to you know, manage the expectations on how they anchor the wage inflation and some of these um, other pressures, which we think have structural um, you know, factors that are driving them. So let me stop there. Thank, thank you, Joyce, and we are eager to speak with you uh, afterwards, and I know many of us have questions we'd love to ask you, and thank you for that great overview. Uh, we are going to now switch to uh, our next presenter. Steve Brozak is the CEO and managing partner of WBB Securities, an investment bank and financial research firm that specializes in biotech, pharmaceutical, and medical device research. He's also the founder and chair of, w, of the WBB Research Institute, a think tank dedicated to understanding critical global issues. Dr. Brozak speaks to institutional audiences and media, sharing his ideas and expertise in identifying healthcare, economic, and military trends. He's a published author in, in multiple journal, journals and is a regular contributor to Forbes, Bloomberg, and ABC News. He most recently has spoken about the SARS COVID uh, pandemic, and he shared his insights into what it might take to, uh, to eradicate this threat and what maybe might be the next chapters in this global pandemic. And really tonight, that's something we're really eager to hear from him. Uh, we heard earlier about, about the JP Morgan forecast for slowing economic growth. And I think it'll be really interesting to hear about COVID's impact uh, on that. He's also a retired Lieutenant Colonel in the, from, in the United States Marine Corps. Thank you for your service. Uh, after retirement, he completed a three-year appointment to the Secretary of Navy's Retiree Council. Uh, he received his undergraduate degree from Columbia and East Asian Studies, his MBA from Columbia in Finance and Economics, and his doctorate in Medical Humanities from Drew University. Uh, for his analysis of the American healthcare system. We're delighted to have you, uh, have you with us here today, and we're eager to hear your presentation, Steve. Thank you. I'm gonna go over here, <laughs> so that way I can, uh, I can uh, not have to strain by looking at the slides. Uh, first off, um, I'd like to thank the uh, Foreign Policy Association for this opportunity to speak to this, this group of people, and online and into the future. So, Thank you very much for these critical uh, discussions on uh, multiple topics in this case. Um, the pandemic economic disconnect. Uh, right now I think this is probably the most disconnected situation we've ever seen in terms of what the drivers are in this economy, not just in the United States, but globally. And um, we need to think about what has taken place in the far past, the recent past, today, and into the future. Next slide, please. Okay, the focal point of my uh, conversation is going to be, obviously we're, we're specifically looking at inflation, supply chain disconnects, exacerbated demand issues, and all the different monetary policies that the Fed is looking to change, but the critical underpinning for this has to, has to be an understanding of COVID and how long it's going to last, what it does, and what the ultimate effect is we're not talking about uh, what the tertiary effects are, but what we're looking at is specifically the primary drivers that will force us to make decisions that are frankly not that easy to understand. Um, COVID, again, will be the primary driver for the foreseeable future. Next slide, please. Okay, as everyone here knows and everyone is going to listen or is listening, uh, markets hate uncertainty. In March of 2020, we had a free fall that frankly took extraordinary measures to rein in. And at that time, there was a question as to whether or not we would see a solvency of world, the world global financial structure, what we had to do. But at that time, we didn't quite understand what the challenge that COVID presented. And um, I'm here today to explain pretty much what we at WBB have analyzed and also, I, I want you to consider this. I'm not here to evoke emotions, okay? I'm here to go out there and point out some of the items that we've been carefully looking at for the last 30 months. 
And um, in our practice at WBB, we've uh, monitored problematic pathogens going back to H5N1 uh, more than 15 years ago. And as a result, we had an understanding of what type of modeling to do and what type of previous modeling took place with different crises that presented themselves. Um, next slide, please. Okay, I don't need to tell you this. Right now, we've got an energy um, inflation that is, uh, hasn't been rivaled in, in generations. Uh, the core underlying inflation is also more significant than in, in the past generation. But these are secondary effects. And uh, what I'm about to explain is why these are secondary effects. Next slide, please. We've been modeling COVID based on a model that goes back about 100 years, the H1N1 1918 pandemic. However, that uh, comparator, everything we've done looking at that is not accurate and problematic. Uh, H1N1 caused the 1918 pandemic. It peaked in roughly three waves that occurred from 1918 into early 1919. The anomalies that we saw were significant deaths in the 26 to 28 year old brackets, which frankly prompted some unusual behavior. But at the end of the day, um, it was one of these situations where it's completely different than what we're seeing today. Rapid onset, which with unfortunately some small solace provided for a quicker analysis of what was gonna take place. It was a pulmonary, pulmonary cause disease. And at the end of the day, it did cause pulmonary cripples throughout the rest of their lives. But at the end of the day, it was a, it was a finite period and it changed very little. Um, in terms of what we're looking at now, SARS-CoV-2 is a coronavirus. It is uh, still operational after two and a half years. It is still as lethal depending on who you are and what your immune system's system is like. And the primary focus of uh, mortality has been in the older population, above 65, and those people that have significant comorbidities. Um, the onset is much, much slower, making it much more difficult to detect in terms of transmission. And the entire body is affected. This is, as they put it, a global disease. And I, I mean that in every sense of the word, but it affects the entirety of the body and it causes an immune system reaction that frankly is far more pervasive, far more problematic than we really understand today. And that's not even going into long COVID, which frankly is, is going to be, is a problem and is going to be an accumulating and accreting problem. Next slide, please. Okay, um, changes in economic planning. Um, what have we seen? We did a Herculean job in developing a vaccine in record time. However, we took some shortcuts and we're now starting to see some of the issues around the strengths of the, uh, of the vaccine. The protection, the neutralizing antibodies that prevents disease transmission is too short to be considered a real vaccine. It is now an ersatz therapeutic. However, that response, the immune system response, is also now proving to be very, very short-lived. So as a result, we're seeing infection and reinfection at rates far greater than we could have ever had hoped for. And that's the Achilles heel of the strategy that we've embarked on. If you look at the other part of the equation, it's actually far worse. Um, half of our population, adult population here in the United States, suffers from one significant comorbidity or chronic disease that makes the, these individuals vulnerable to infection in a dil, significantly del, deleterious way. Uh, a quarter of the adult population have two or more of these uh, comorbidities. And as I can attest to, 70% of the American population is either overweight or obese, which are also significant problematic factors in what we're dealing with. Um, now, as a glimpse of what we're gonna talk about, the many more people back more than a century ago would have survived this with better outcomes based on the fact that they were frankly in better shape. But we have a weaker population. And as a result, we have other issues to contend with. One third of the recruits that go into or try to get into the UM force, US Armed Forces today are rejected based on health issues. So it isn't just the older population, it's the entirety of the US population. You can see the uh, unfortunate adult obesity rate just climbing continuously. Next slide, please. Okay, now we're gonna to start to talk about what the issues are that we're facing today. Um, the next COVID wave is imminent. 
And that's something that we're looking at that uh, in yesterday's VRPAC meeting, this is a vaccine meeting that was, um, that was sponsored by the FDA. In that specific meeting, Dr. Peter Marks, the director of CBER, went out and explained um, that we are looking at a situation where we're seeing waning immunity based on vaccine and prior infection, and we're seeing an emergence of novel viruses, novel variants, I should say, that are critical. Next slide, please. Now, this is probably the most um, crowded slides, but I have to explain this to you because this is, this, this is the crux of what we're looking at. What we have here are numbers directly from the CDC that track variants. And on the variant side, you can see on the left, you have those two green bars that go on the bottom. This is the new variants. These are the new variants, BA4, BA5. They are um, highly um, problematic variants in that they escape both uh, infection, prior infection, and vaccination. This is from last week. The numbers we were talking about were just over 30%. This week, those same numbers here in the United States crossed to 51%. This acceleration is far greater than anyone could have anticipated, and it's far, far more problematic in terms of dealing with how you control a virus, how you control infection, and what I'm going to lead into is specifically how the economy, how people in key opinion positions, how people that have to make the financial underpinning decisions are going to control this. So that's really one of the significant things that I, I, you have to take away from this in terms of understanding what follows. Next slide, please. Okay, I've told you what COVID is not. So what is it? Um, and what's the prior model that we need to look at? The prior model we need to look at is not 1918. It's 1889, something called the Russian flu. You can all check on your phones, or if you're watching at home, you can Wikipedia it. It's specific to um, a pandemic that took place, and it started in 1889. And at that po point, it began to do things to society that had never been documented ever before or since in, in this way until COVID. And its impact was remarkably similar to what we're seeing today with COVID. Um, and the impact on the economy was striking in terms of what it meant. Next slide, please. Just so we go over the specifics around this, you can see the 1889 Russian flu, 2019 COVID pandemic under CDC, the issues. Um, the 1889 documentation is provided by a researcher, statistician, clinician, demographer out of Paris by the name of Bertillon. Um, to the best of my knowledge, his documents have not been, um, have not been translated into English. However, they've been uh, attributed repeatedly by writers today. And if you basically transfer it into PDF, you can use Google Translate and get an English version. And it'll tell you some things that are frankly are um, more than just problematic. But what he saw were the same exact symptoms we're talking about today to include the central nervous system issues we're looking at, loss of taste, smell, high fever, and uh, severe illness leading to death, which in this case we've identified as um, sepsis. Next slide, please. Okay, so what did it do? It lasted roughly from 1889 to 1894. When I mean lasted, the monitored deaths that took place uh, dropped below certain monitorable levels, excess deaths, in, by 1894. The global death rates were into the millions, uh, we don't have a good way of analyzing the data because, as you can imagine, deaths back then were not as critically monitored. Um, but here's the critical takeaway. Um, a recession occurred, a panic actually, starting in 1893 that led to a global depression. Um, and it affected every part of the industries in, that were existing back then. Uh, I'm sure the buggy whip makers were complaining even though today we have none, but you know, you can understand what the, the uh, current comparators would be. Today, we're looking, and again, it's 2019 to 2022, we're looking at a situation where plus minus, we're north of three million. Underreporting is probably by a factor of two, so we're probably about six million uh, dead. In the United States, we average at, a, we're saying about a million. 
Um, I can go into details as far as why those numbers are probably closer to two million, but you know, I've got 20 minutes here. Um, our modeling says we are currently in a recession, in a global recession, um, and the data that just came out shows a 1.6% drop in uh, Q1 GDP here in the United States. Every, in, every part of the industry uh, in terms of our economy has been challenged, not just here, but globally. Next slide, please. The COVID economy. Back in 1893, what were some of the issues? Again, we had an economic depression, bag panics. Um, we had failures in interesting areas. We had a railway system that completely collapsed. Um, you might remember a character by the name of Jay Gould. He took advantage of this by going out there and consolidating the industry uh, you know, for cents on the dollar. Uh, you had frozen credit or the credit systems, unemployment soared, and you know the perpetual home and, homes and savings rate, uh, homes and savings were lost. Um, right now we're looking at 8.6% inflation. Fed interest rates the highest that they've been uh, in terms of uh, uh, a generation, rising unemployment, then a slowing of the economic, uh, of the, uh, economic growth. When I say rising unemployment, we have a different way of looking at employment today. And in terms of those seeking jobs, we're now having issues in terms of monitoring them. And frankly, I think by probably next quarter, we're going to start to see some very unusual data, or at least that's what we're tracking. So what happened? What did they try and do? Back then, economic legislation, it caused increased government spending. Today, uh, we've got increased government spending for the COVID recovery. I'm not, I'm not weighing in on whether or not one is right or wrong. I'm just saying that's what we've done. Of course, the answer back then was tax revenues decrease and federal surpluses became deficits. And of course, we've been in deficit spending uh, ever since here. On the instability on the monetary policy side, it continued back then for years and years. As a matter of fact, it was the, probably the germination of an idea that we needed a stronger fiscal monetary system. And as a result, uh, within 20 years, we had the birth of the Fed. Um, and here, well, what we're looking at now is an exacerbation of these problems as we continue into this pandemic. Next slide, please. 1889, transportation, as I mentioned before. These are comparables that are frankly eerily similar. Um, newspapers back then, the birth of yellow journalism, monopolies, of course, we had the railroad, the steel industries, social, we had popular unrest, uh, labor, uh, we had rise in unions, and believe it or not, we had a ditch effort to go out there and compensate for things using the mining of silver. Today, um, again, problems with shipping. We've seen a troubling of prices for goods that were shipped from Asia in terms of what took place. Uh, we have issues in terms of just-in-time rail shipping. The frailty of the media. Uh, I don't need to tell anyone here that social media has taken on forms that, were never ima that weren't imaginable 20 years ago. Uh, monopolies, in this case we have the internet, we have communications, social media, uh, popular unrest is here. Uh, labor, well, we had a phenomenon called the Great Resignation. It's continued, but now we're starting to see some unusual behavior after that. And uh, I'd like to put in the mining part. Instead of silver, we have cryptocurrency, which is kind of funny. Both were attempts at escaping the issues around uh, the financial and monetary structures. Next slide, please. Technology comparables. We had the uh, Gilded Age, the invention of all these wonderful um, uh, technologies that allowed us to go into a modern society from electricity, light bulbs, film, um, relay lines, and, and transportation systems. Today, we have AI, machine learning, the metaverse, uh, video conferencing, which thank you uh, th for providing that for the uh, teleportation of this presentation. Next slide, please. Other eight, uh, just so, just to, when we did our research, we wanted to go out there and say, what are the other items here that may have interfered? We had the Sherman Antitrust Act, which was, which was a debilitating system on the, on the um, uh, specifically on commerce. We had the rise of socialism, uh, which basically uh, we had, and I know you're going to find this hard to believe, but we had the rise of fringe political groups that basically, um, you know, really challenged the United States and its sovereignty, so uh, think about that. We had unprecedented economic growth in industry and technology, and unfortunately, we also had 
the rise of Jim Crow in the South and a perpetual system of political um, uh, domination, again, primarily in the South. Next slide, please. We had a presidency, and again, I'm not weighing in in terms of the current presidency, but I'm just saying that um, it was an era of unprecedented economic legislation, uh, a spike in spending and a spike in, uh, and a decrease in tax revenues. The monetary policy that we looked at, and I'm happy to talk about silver, but um, I, frankly, it would, it would go away from this. And we had matters of you know, poor timing, poor harvest, but again, the Great Depression that has ensued uh, was significant. And um, we had issues that, frankly, uh, were never resolved um, by you know, central government involvement. Next slide, please. Okay, before I go into what we must do, I want to say from yesterday's VRPAC meeting, which is the vaccine FDA uh, meeting, where they approved the use of next generation vaccines, the chair of that committee made a statement that is still striking. He said, and his name is Monto, this virus doesn't follow the rules. It follows the rules, of course, but they're not our rules. It's the virus's rules. And um, again, we were looking at a situation where one of the things they mentioned in terms of manufacturing a vaccine was that they even recognized that there are supply chain issues in the medical therapeutic technological area. China has embarked on a zero tolerance COVID approach, which frankly, given their abilities, given their technologies, given their control of society, is possibly a practical solution for them if you can last as long as you can um, uh, under that type of system. However, the issues that we're talking about here are devastating if you think about what the implications are here to us economically. So, what do we do next? Understand how COVID kills and how it cripples. Understand what the vaccine limitations are now going forward. We need to now understand surveillance detection and documentation, specifically around how do we control it, and also how do we understand what the economic second and third courses of action are going to be. The modeling analytics, we critically need to understand those. We need to develop them. I'm thinking to myself, if Renaissance Technologies was to go out there and shut down their hedge fund that goes into um, you know, algorith algorithmic trading and turn over to say, well, we want to understand how COVID works, that they could probably uh, provide us with a solution in six months just based on that type of uh, orthogonal approach. But barring that, we haven't really gotten on base with a, a system of solving this. At the end of the day, the therapeutic resolution is the only one that's possible for COVID. And I'm not talking about just basically people getting sick. I'm talking about life-threatening COVID and long COVID. Lastly, our continuing response to COVID. Again, I want to thank the Foreign Policy Association for this opportunity, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And uh, thank you again, Joyce. And maybe what I'll do is while you all think of your questions, I'll kick off with a, with a couple of quick ones. Um, Joyce, I have a question for you. Uh, when you. I saw that in your forecast, you have an economic slowdown as we go into 2023. Is there any primary metric, indicator, statistic that you're watching that might be the single most important indicator directionally for where, where we're going. Uh, do you have any, uh, is there one that stands out above, above the others? Yeah, yeah um, no, it's a great question, but I, I think it's the consumer confidence um, indicator. And what you could just see is that as inflation went up, your consumer confidence went down, even as we saw consumer spending increase. So we are still in this, you know, reopening from COVID where there's pent up demand and there's spending, but everything that Steve says, you know, very much worries me about the next COVID wave being eminent, that 
you know, some of this pent-up demand, and, and that China, I do think, will stay with the zero COVID policies as well. But I would say that the consumer confidence is the key thing we look at. But when we talk specifically about the recession risk, we're really looking at the tightness of the labor market um, as a key indicator. Um, and, I, and I think that, um, you know, as Steve mentioned, there's many different ways where you can look at the tightness of the labor market. That part of it is, um, you know, the labor force participation rate, the um, sort of um, shortages in specific sectors. Um, you know, uh, there's also uh, just uh, what we see in the demographics as far as you know, over 55 women in the labor force who will come back. But I would say that consumer confidence is the key measure we're looking at because that has been disconnected from the consumer spending. Um, and I think that that is, is really the key in the candidate I look at right now. Terrific. Um, and then why don't, why don't I switch to, uh, to Steve? I'll, I'll switch over to Steve and then we'll, we'll open it up to the crew uh, uh, in the audience here for either of them. But uh, Steve, those, I think that increasing mix change that you showed in that one slide about variant four and five, if I stated it correctly. BA four, five. BA yep. four, four and BA five. Uh, if you were to think about modeling and projecting it, it, a month's time, six weeks from now, what do you think the impact will be? Will we just have rising cases again? Or, or what do you think that will mean on society? Well, if I was to go to the supplemental slides, the formula is pretty simple, unfortunately. It's infection, which leads to hospital visits, which leads to hospitalization, which leads to ICU admittance, which leads to death or long recovery. So at the end of the day, those numbers now are going to Frankly, at that growth rate, which we've not really seen before, we're talking about something that, uh, well, frankly, is very, very bothersome. And understand this, it doesn't have to be worse. It just has to be quicker, because that's when you see the surge capacities take place. We understand shortages and supply shortages, but the hospital system is always operating at close to 100%. So they can probably go to 110%, but above that number, now you start to see breakdown issues. People who have heart attacks, people who have accidents, they can't gain access to normal health care. People who have been foregoing normal health care for all these months and years are not getting healthier, they're getting worse. Now BA4 is a, is a escape pathogen that affects primarily those who have never been vaccinated. It is a reinfectious pathogen. So you had it, you'll have it again. BA5 is an even more interesting poser. That's one that affects people who have been vaccinated. So we're seeing a virus act to do one thing, to live. And whatever it has to do to live, it will do. BA4 and 5 are the next series that we're talking about. And you cannot build accurate economic models going out more than in a few weeks, maybe a month, based on that kind of pressure. It just, all, all of a sudden, your assumptions basically are, are, are become problematic because now you're talking about you know, two, three orders of magnitude difference in, in terms of the basic, uh, basic uh, assumptions you have to make. So when I think about what that might mean, and I think about the, the most recent surge that we had when, there were, when you saw the, the number of cases increasing um, and how it started to slow down the economy and society again and things that we we're all able to do, um, is that what happens, you think? Do you think these, the, will, will these variants be more deadly, do you think, or, or will it just drive more cases? Um, they don't have to be more deadly, and here's why. Everyone in this room has more than likely been vaccinated, but the distance between your prior vaccination and your current T-cell, B-cell, your immunity to general diseases, is waning. So if you were boosted a year ago, even six months ago, you really have very little protection against any kind of infection. So at the end of the day, the outcomes we're talking about there will become more severe. And if you want to put in the devil's brew or the witch's brew, um, we don't have the money earmarked to pay for these vaccines. In other words, Congress has basically said no to the U.S. government purchasing these vaccines that frankly are problematic because they were um, superimposed on a system for a vaccine for a uh, variant that no longer is in circulation. The current booster that was just voted on was predicated on the original Omicron strain, which is no longer really in circulation. BA4 and 5 are, um, are problematic, so at the end of the day, we couldn't get a vaccine out within enough time. Interesting, thank you. What I'd like to do now is 
turn it over to the group. We have a question in the back there. Thank you, Matt. Matt will bring you the microphone like he just did, so thank you. Thank you. Um, between the Russian flu and COVID, of course, we've had the vaccine. Do you think that the vaccine ultimately will have hurt or helped as far as the timing for this? How long it lasts? Probably a little bit of both. I mean, the vaccine approach was one that made sense given the limited knowledge we had at the very beginning. But when we started to see some of the data come out, that's when we should have focused exclusively on a therapeutic resolution. And that's what, candidly, we should be focused on today and understanding the, the immunological response. Because at the end of the day, we cannot have a thriving economy. We cannot have a return to whatever the new normal is going to be as long as we're seeing the singular pressure that continued surges will provide. Question in the front here. Hi, my name is um, Dr. Brian Cole, and I'm a practicing physician and one of the Pfizer doctors that led the Javits immunization program. As a UN person, we've been networking with Geneva and Vienna talking about that actually the Omicron virus and the COVID virus is actually like a predator virus having a beehive mentality that it can sense you know, weakness or lack of antibodies or neutralizing antibodies. That's a theory that we're discussing openly now that it's a predator virus. And a predator like honeybeans knows where the honey is and they communicate to each other. This is one thing that I think we need to bring open to the public, that COVID is not like measles and mumps, like a machine, you know, a washing machine virus, that it's actually a predator virus. It can sense if you're um, not vaccinated or boosted it appropriately. Doctor, how can we add that discussion academically to the fold from the UN system? We've been talking about that for six months and it's quite dramatic and, and, and disconcerting, but we need to add that, that COVID is highly most likely a predator virus and it's sentient. It probably thinks. So most people don't like to hear that, but we okay. need to add that to the academic forum. I, I can't comment on sentient beings, but I can say that it, 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 at the end of the day, it does one thing, it, it wants to survive, and it'll do whatever it has to. In terms of what do I advocate, the White House is clearly in the leadership position right now, in addition to the economic forms that we're talking about, and, and Powell basically stated that some mistakes were made in terms of the approach in understanding the changes that took place with COVID in 2020. We need to understand what the changes are taking place with COVID in 2022, 2023, 2024, and the 2020s. That's the only way we can solve this. We had a question right there, right next to you, Matt. A uh, question for Joyce. Given uh, what you guys are projecting for economic activity going forward, how are you thinking about demand destruction uh, as it relates to crude and refined products uh, pricing uh, 12 to 18 months out? So we think that you are going to be in a period of elevated commodity prices where you will have, um, you know, uh, you know, a WTI at, you know, $100. I, I'm not in the camp that says it's 140 to 150 dollars because I think that there are still buyers of Russian oil who are willing to do this at a very deep discount. I mean, it's too irresistible to pass up if you can buy oil at a 35, you know, um, you know, dollar discount. So there have been buyers for Russian oil. I am not that confident that a ban and the sanctions are going to work. So I'm not in the, 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 the camp that thinks that you go to $150 because these bans are effective, but I think you stay in this elevated range. You know, we just haven't seen the demand um, destruction, even with um, gas going to over $5 at the pump right now. And you're in the peak driving season through Labor Day. So we continue to have, um, you know, the oil price forecast at you know, around $100. Um, and I think we are in a cycle that will last for a couple of years where you see very elevated um, oil prices. And, um, you know, I think a lot of the constraints um, that we're seeing right now 
um, it's not just you know, one factor. It is partly that there has not been capbacks by the large oil companies as they move towards clean energy. So some of the traditional, um, the critical infrastructure is um, you know, not working right now. We estimate the capex shortfall by large oil companies at the current oil prices is you know, as, as anywhere between 350 to 600 billion dollars. So there's the demand side of the equation. There's um, just some of the infrastructure constraints, which I think um, you know, are um, longer term issues um, that are uh, with us. So I think that you have to be prepared for us to be in this period of elevated um, commodity prices um, that will last for some years. We have next questions here in the front. Thanks, Matt. <clears throat> Yes, uh, Irene Fennell Honigman. I'm uh, at SIPA School of International Public Affairs at Columbia. And my question uh, perhaps provides a tiny note of optimism in this discussion. Uh, going back to the period, and thank you, of 1893, uh, and looking at 2020, one thing that is very striking is we were looking at a time where there was a very, very little financial oversight and the fundamental sense of reforms and coordination between central banks was basically non-existent. We didn't have one in the US. In fact, amusingly, the United States turned to J.P. Morgan uh, in uh, 1893 as its uh, sort of ersatz central banker as it had and as it would till uh, 1907. So uh, w the question and the point I'm making is one thing we did see in 2020, which was striking, was that we did not have any major bank collapse. We did not see which would have been a total disaster, uh, the inability of the central banks to coordinate, in fact, the contrary. And I was wondering whether moving forward into what may very well be the next stage of the crises, do you see that we already have reforms based on the lessons of 2008 and what now was done with 2020? Do you think that these reforms will allow the economy, if not to do well, but at least to remain relatively stable in terms particularly of the banking sector and coordination between the central banks. So who is that question? Oh, sorry. I think that was to Joyce. I think that question was to okay. Joyce. So, so I, 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 I think Tom probably has views on this as well. Like, you know, I don't think that the next crisis comes from the banking system. I mean, frankly, after the global financial crisis, you had so many um, regulations that were put into place about capital requirements. Um, you know, that um, the, the banks, you know, were just not a source of the crisis. Okay. And I think that was a fundamental shift as far as the whole uh, you know, regulatory late? landscape. Um, you know, that was put into place. But I think. That that what we have seen is, you know, the very rapid growth of fintech, um, and what you have seen is, you know, it, the in the digital assets and crypto, you know, a very very rapid sell off in some of these areas that are not regulated. So I wouldn't look at a banking crisis or a, or even like the, the housing crisis. I think we're in a housing affordability crisis, but I don't think it is, you know, a housing crisis along the lines of what we saw in 2008 and 2009. But on the central bank um, coordination, I'm getting more concerned. Um, just the, um, the strategy of going towards friend shoring, um, more of the geoeconomics of who we will coordinate with, questions on whether the G20 even exists anymore, you know, how the US and China will work with each other. You know, I think that the US has um, been very successful at you know, creating an alliance you know, in response to Russia and Ukraine with European partners. It's reached out to a lot of the Asian democracies. But I do think that um, you really do have, if you look at the G20, like you know, 10, of, 10 countries were for the sanctions, 10 countries were against the sanctions um, that were put into place. So I actually think it could be a more complicated period to get coordination across developed markets and emerging markets the next time a crisis um, comes about. I do think that the banking system is actually you know, much smaller than it was um, you know, as a share of the economy as you've had the non-bank system, the FinTech you know, system grow even more um, during this crisis. So I don't see that as the source of the crisis, but I also think that the banks are also not a source of intermediating a lot of the risk that we see right now, which is happening outside of the banking system. 
Steve? Okay, I'll answer three quick answers. One, we do biotech. Biotech today is unfundable. All the biotech IPOs that took place in 2020, 2021, cannot find any money at any price anywhere. Tells me that the research engines that we look at for healthcare are pretty much left to their own devices. So if you're thinking about innovation, if you're thinking about anything along those lines, there is nothing to look forward to on that front. Two, on the crypto side, as, as Joyce discussed, it's a, it's a novel phenomenon in terms of what takes place, but there is no regulation. We've just seen a hedge fund collapse that's a crypto purveyor. So at the end of the day, how do you regulate something where most of the regulators don't even know what the heck is going on in the first instance? So that, that's an unfortunate and very, very scary part. And as far as the Fed goes, the Fed was established for a reason. But the Fed has a hammer, and to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. What can they do? What can they really do when we're talking about nuances available? You're talking uh, nuances required and is not available. These are the issues we're dealing with right now that even the Fed will admit they've never seen before. Uh, I, we have time for uh, probably one more question. So please. So I'm really caught off guard about the uh, comments about COVID. I was expecting to be talking about the economy, but uh, maybe I can stir it back. It, uh, previously, there was this balancing act between health concerns and economic concerns. In light of what you're saying, COVID still being with us, um, do you anticipate that we're going to have uh, another kind of economic uh, shutdown? I mean, you know, in other words, what would be the economic impact of uh, what you're describing? I I believe that uh, another economic shutdown, the likes of which we have, is unsustainable. Um, it is, it, it's, de it's more devastating than the disease to the, the degree we're talking about. But I do also believe that we now have to have a different approach to how we deal with the disease and specifically the mortality and morbidity of the disease. The approach that we were looking at was a one size fits all vaccine is not practical. And if it was, it would have already been accomplished. So the idea is now we need to turn our resources and our massive resources if we do so, the same way we understand combat and war, to solving the um, issue around dealing with people not dying or suffering the significant long COVID effects. You do that and you run the chance of going out there and restoring the economy very, very quickly. You don't do that, and frankly, I, I really I, or models don't, we don't have modeling capacity to see what, what the issues are there. We, we did have one more question I saw that we, we, I think it was this woman right here. Did you have a question? Or was the question behind you? Okay, there you go. This is uh, absolutely the last one. Then. Okay. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, Joyce, very quickly, how does a company like JP Morgan uh, brace for a recession uh, since your models are very impressive, over 60 and 80 percent over one and two years, I think it was. So how does a company like that handle it? And I'm going to add a little something to that, Joyce, because your uh, boss, Jamie Dimon, recently <laughs> got the market very uh, excited with his comments about the weather and his analogies of how there was a hurricane coming. So maybe what we'll do is we'll expand upon that question and maybe uh, does Jamie use your model when he talks about the economy and the weather? <laughs> Well, you know, so Jamie Dimon has very famously said, you know, you have to hope for the best, but plan for the worst. But one thing I would say, you know, the chart that I started out with is a, a, a lot of this hurricane has already been happening, right? We are looking at, you know, precedents um, which have never been set before as far as the magnitude of the sell-off, the rapid pace of it, um, you know, and also things that we don't have any models for. I mean, we've not had quantitative tightening before. We didn't even really get a chance to talk about them. There's no precedent for how you look at that. And I think the market may really be underestimating that. So it is, you know, um, you know, you know the, the questions we're getting are sort of, you know, not if there is a recession, but when could it occur and will it be um, shallower? the previous recessions and i do think there are reasons to think it will be shallower just because we haven't built up the same excesses um in the housing market 
you know, there is less risk in the banking system right now, and there's less, and, and corporate and households have um, stronger balance sheets. So even if there is a recession, I think it could be not one that has the kinds of systemic shocks that we've seen before. But what does um, a bank like J.P. Morgan do? Well, there's really um, you know a, a couple of different answers to that. First of all, there have been um, a lot of um, very targeted programs that J.P. Morgan has put out that really go out to the segments that are the hardest hit by the downturn. And that means like the $30 billion investment looking at sort of race and equity, affordable housing, what we do in the local communities. And that was something that really came about um, as a result of the pandemic. So there's one initiative that really kind of takes more of a micro look at that. Then there is just sort of the you know the, the 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 fortress balance sheet, which is sort of you know beyond what um, you know even the regulations you know you call for as far as the kinds of stress tests that you know the bank ends up running you know running oil at 150, 180, you know running the like shallow recession scenarios and you know how one navigates through that. And then there is another aspect of it that other parts of the market because there's more market volatility, you know figuring out the best way to you know trade that and manage that. Risk. And look, I think that one thing I mentioned the market um, uh, volatility, but the financial conditions are going to be a very big part of how the health of the economy is is considered this time around. So you think about like the treasury market; that's a market that's grown fivefold to twenty two trillion dollars, but the intermediation in it hasn't changed, and the banks are not holding the risk. So I think you could have very amplified financial market moves that stay with us, just like we've seen over the last. Um, a couple of months, but it is. You can also see some of the announcements that have come out about, like you know, on the mortgage lending space. Is that getting retrenched? The comments that Steve made on innovation. Are we seeing that some of this um, investment in areas where there has been a lot of expansion on the digital side that everybody's going to be more careful about it during in this kind of environment? Well, Joyce, thank you for that, and and thank you, Steve as well for your presentation and your kindness in sharing this time with us. Thank you all for joining us here in person as well as uh, via the web. And on behalf of the Foreign Policy Association, thank you for coming.